Um, the violent universe. Um, you could have called this the biggest bangs in the universe, but I thought that wouldn't be such a nice title, really. So I'm going to talk, however, about what are the largest bangs in the universe. There are two types. Uh, the major part of the talk, I think, will be about what are called gamma ray bursts. And for the last third, perhaps, I'll talk about what perhaps was the biggest bang of all, the Big Bang, at the origin of our universe, which was an explosion of a very different and unique type. So we've got really two things, but they're combined by the fact that they were some pretty big, or are some pretty big bangs. So, to start with, gamma ray bursts. Um, it's an interesting story. The discovery of what we call gamma ray bursts, or GRBs for short, basically came out of the Cold War. In 1963, uh, the USA, USSR and the UK signed a nuclear test ban treaty. Now, the Americans weren't at all sure that the Russians would abide by it. Now, there are obviously two things you can do. You can try and explode a nuclear bomb underground, and I can promise you the whole of the world was covered with incredibly sensitive seismometers so the Americans could detect any underground explosions. But obviously the Russians knew that, and it was thought that they might actually try and explode nuclear bombs in space in the hope they wouldn't be detected. So in order to prevent that happening, the Americans produced a series of what are called VALA, or what were called VALA satellites. VALA means watchers. And uh, they were put up there. They had gamma ray detectors upon them. And the objective was to detect, if there was a nuclear explosion in space, a very characteristic signature, we might call it, where you get, in fact, a double burst of gamma rays when the nuclear bomb is exploded. So these were sitting up in space uh, from about 1963 onwards. In 1967, although the data was actually being analysed by hand, it wasn't analysed uh, until a couple of years later, they discovered a very odd burst that had none of the right characteristics of having come from a nuclear explosion. You can see there was an initial very rapid spike and a dip, then a rather more gentle spike, and then a long, gradual tail-off. And they'd never seen anything like this before. It was obviously nothing to do with a nuclear explosion. And this is, in fact, what the team leader of the Vela project said. One thing that was immediately apparent was this was not the result of a clandestine nuclear test. Well, they put more Vela satellites up, each little series being better than the previous ones, and quite a number of events were detected. And initially, these were classified. Um, in fact, the Vela project wasn't actually secret. The Americans had told the Russians that they'd done this, but it was sort of, at least not terribly out in the open. But finally, in 1973, the results were declassified and Clebassabel published the first results. 16 confirmed bursts in the journal Nature, which, as you probably know, is the UK journal, probably one of the two preeminent science journals in the world. Um, it was called Observations of Gamma, Gamma May, sorry, Gamma Ray Births of Cosmic Origin. I, I couldn't find a picture of the appropriate Nature Journal on the web, but this is one I thought would do. It's actually from 1869. <laughs> but anyway, it's a wonderful journal. It's, it's, I've had a few papers published in Nature, and it's, it's very, very, very pleasing when that happens. Um, just a little aside, on the 22nd of September 1979, Vela did detect a flash that looked as though it might have been a nuclear test. It took place over the centre here. Well, they call it the Mid-Atlantic Flash. You can argue whether it's the Atlantic or the Indian Ocean, but it was here. Um, that has been very largely classified. Not very much has come out into the open about that. But from what I read, and I've done quite a bit of reading, that it looks as though it actually might well have been a nuclear test, which was initiated by South Africa with possible assistance from Israel. There are people that say that they are sure that was the case. So it may be the Vela craft did actually achieve one of its 
prime objectives or its main objective, but the real thing about Vela was it discovered these cosmic, uh, these gamma ray bursts. Well, having learnt about these things, you want to find out more. So they designed and built the Compton Gamma Ray Observatory. These things take quite a while to do. It didn't actually get launched till 1991. But over nine years, it observed over 3,000 gamma ray bursts. These short, rapid, very bright bursts of gamma rays. Um, it had on it a thing called BATSI, the Burst and Transient Source Experiment. And essentially, there were eight of these little detectors, one on each corner, so it could look around the whole sky. And this is a very significant image. It shows you all of the BATSI gamma ray bursts, 2,704 of them, basically plotted on an all-sky map, with, in fact, our Milky Way running across the centre. That will be the centre of the Milky Way. Possibly there's a slight gap there, because I think it would be very hard to see through the middle of the Milky Way. But the important thing about that is that is a pretty uniform distribution across the whole sky. Compare that with this picture, which is a distribution of what are called pulsars, more a bit about those later on. And these are the remnants of stars in our own Milky Way. As a result, you would expect the majority of them to lie along the plane of the Milky Way because that's where the stars are. And that's exactly what you can see here. You do see them all around the sky as well, but not nearly so many. So if you see something like that, you say, well, it's to do with the Milky Way. If you see something like this, you say, no, it's got nothing to do with the Milky Way at all. These things must be at quite great distances from us in the space beyond our little local universe. So by this time, it was known that CRBs had an origin well beyond our galaxy, as you've just seen, there was no bias towards the plane of the Milky Way. Also, whenever they looked at where they thought the bursts might have come from, which wasn't too easy in the early days, they couldn't see anything. And that rather implied that these objects were a very long way away. So that was a good start. But what you really wanted to be able to do was to locate very precisely where this gamma ray burst came from. And the next satellite, called BEPO-SACS, which was an Italian and Dutch satellite, played a very significant role in our understanding of these wonderful objects. Because within seconds of the observation of a gamma ray burst by its detectors, it could actually orient itself and take further imaging to look at what is called the afterglow. Following the brief few seconds or a bit more gamma ray bursts, there tends to be an afterglow in the optical, the radio, the X-ray and so on. So if you can look quick enough, you can see that, and if your instrument has got much higher resolution, then you can actually find out where it is. So that's the key thing you want to do. And it made two absolutely key observations, GRB 970228, which probably tells you it was the 28th of February in 1997, and the other one was the 8th of May, 1997. And these were absolutely fundamental to our understanding of what these things actually are. It's not, not all that long ago, really. Well, the first one, as I said, was detected in February, 1997, and within a few minutes, Beppo Sachs had got its cameras onto it and found the position to a precision of about three arc minutes. That's not that good, but at least it's good enough to allow other telescopes to have a look within the field of view that a typical large telescope has got. Uh, that actually shows you their image, in effect, and you can see that this is two arc minutes here, so the size of that is about three arc minutes. Uh, the fact that says plus means it's in the northern part of the... Uh, sky and uh, five hours just tells you how far around the sky it is. So that's a very, very key observation. That position was told to the people at the UK's William Herschel Telescope. They keep on saying they're going to close it down, but I think it's still there. It's a lovely telescope. Um, my boss, Professor Francis Graham-Smith, had a lot to do with its um, 
construction. And the site is actually at La Palma, on the island of La Palma in, in the uh, Canaries. They were able to observe that position within 20 hours. And they were able to see the afterglow, the optical afterglow of the gamma ray burst. So they could refine its position. And that meant that the Hubble Space Telescope could then, once the afterglow had gone, they only last a few days, could actually look to try and see what was there, where the gamma ray burst had come from. And this is, in fact, the Hubble image that was produced shortly afterwards. That was on September the 16th. Um, this is the little bit of the, the sky you want to look at. It's around here. That's that bit. And that's been expanded. So just this bit here is expanded to this bit. So that's that. This is the galaxy where the gamma ray burst originated from. It's called the progenitor galaxy. And that little dot basically is the remnant of the afterglow of the actual GRB. So this was the very first time that the very, very precise position of the GRB had been found and at least in the first instance it showed it was in a very, very faint galaxy which sort of implies it's a very, very long way away. Now they weren't able to get a spectra which lets you find the distance for some time. Uh, when they finally did they discovered, that was the spectrum, they discovered that this object was at a distance of 8.1 billion light years. Now, our universe is about 13.7 billion light years old, so can you see you're looking back in time over halfway? So this is a very, very distant object. The next of those pair, or that pair of GRBs, was in May that year, that was detected by Beppo Sachs. And uh, the William Herschel telescope here was able to have a look and uh, uh, image it at optical wavelengths. So they got the precise position really quite quickly. And this is the Hale telescope, the lovely 5 metre, the 200 inch telescope, we always used to call it in the days of yore uh, at Mount Palomar, a lovely telescope. And here you can actually see the optical afterglow actually going up. This is May the 9th, it peaked on May the 10th and then died away again. So you get this typical sort of rise and gentle um, drop in the brightness at these other wavelengths, not gamma rays. The gamma ray burst is very short, but then you get a rise in the radio, the optical, the X-ray, ultraviolet, which you can then perhaps see. And this time, in fact, the very large array of telescopes in America, um, the Americans are not terribly modest about what they call it, uh, we have something we call the very small array, <laughs> which is on Tenerife. But compared to this, which is 36 kilometres across, our array on Tenerife is only a few metres, so perhaps we're not being modest or otherwise. Anyway, it was able to show that the afterglow, as seen in the radio, was incredibly small in angular size, really point-like. And in fact, that shows you, in fact, the brightness seen on the 10th, so the 9th of May, and that had dropped quite significantly by the 14th of May. This was the spectrum, and that was actually found quite quickly. And that had a redshift of 0.8, and that tells you that the galaxy is at a distance of 6 billion light years. At the time, that was the most distant GRB they knew of. It was a while before they found the redshift of the other one. So these things were a very, very long way away. The fact that we see them implies they must emit a very large amount of energy. Well, the next spacecraft to come along was called SWIFT, and that's still there. And it is a multi-wavelength space-based observatory, which means it's got X-ray, ultraviolet and optical telescopes as well. So the idea is that it actually detects in the gamma rays the approximate position of one of these bursts. It then slews itself around so that its optical X-ray and other telescopes can look at that direction, at that position, and can image it in far higher, uh, at far higher resolution. So there's the SWIFT spacecraft. All the bits that matter are up the front here. These are the solar panels, of course. That's looking down on it. These are artists' impressions. 
But the things that matter, that is the actual gamma ray detector, and then you can see here we have ultraviolet and X-ray telescopes that can be focused or pointed towards the position of the gamma ray burst. And that can be done very, very quickly. So SWIFT can find the precise position of a gamma ray burst, well, within seconds or certainly within a minute or so. And that's key because by that time, or at that time, some of the afterglows are really pretty bright. So within 10 seconds, it's produced an arc minute resolution image. And it can point, as I said, and, and, and refine that even better. What they then do is that position is radioed down to ground and effectively broadcast over the internet in what's called the Gamma Ray Burst Coordination Network. So all other telescopes around the world can in principle find out the position of that Gamma Ray Burst more or less within seconds, certainly within a minute. And this is the basic idea. Here is a Gamma Ray Burst. This is not to scale as you can imagine. Here is SWIFT, but there are other spacecraft up there that can detect gamma rays now. And it's been detected by SWIFT. It sends down its data to here. That actually then sends it back up to these other spacecraft so they can look as well, because there's an X-ray spacecraft up there, Ulysses and so on, but also out to telescopes, both radio and optical, on the ground. So within a minute or so, if telescopes can slew quickly, you can have a whole host of other telescopes observing the source of the gamma ray burst pretty much as it happens. And this is one of these high slew rate telescopes, not necessarily a very big one. Uh, that one I think is in Australia, but he certainly looks quite pleased with it on the right there. Um, one that I know more about is the Liverpool John Moores uh, robotic telescope, which is on La Palma. And this is, again, the same idea. Here's a gamma ray burst. The gamma rays are picked up by SWIFT. SWIFT notifies that information by downlink. It goes through the internet. The Liverpool Robotic Telescope can slew within a minute or two onto that position, take an image, which is then sent back to Liverpool University, to some of my friends there. So that's the sort of thing that's now happening every time a gamma ray burst is detected. And they're being, they're being detected now several times a day, basically. So that's a rather lovely view of the Liverpool John Moores Telescope with the Milky Way above. And I always wonder that's probably a composite image because that would be jolly hard to take. I wouldn't know how to do it, but it still looks good, doesn't it? And this is a lovely telescope. There are two-metre telescopes. Uh, they built a factory, which is on the Wirral, to build these. I think they've built four, maybe five now. Two of them are called the Fox Telescopes. Do you remember when I talked about the um, search for Planet X with my friend? Some of you here, we actually used it robotically to, d to, to image the most distant object that we know of in the solar system. So this is one of the same type of telescope. Sadly, as far as I know, they've stopped producing them. So, uh, what's the most distant GRB that we know of? Well, it's actually this one here. It's, it's in Leo, the constellation of Leo. It was detected in... Uh, 1999. Sorry, no, I, I lie. Sorry, 2009, so not that long ago. And from its spectrum, we know that the light was emitted when the universe was just 630 million years old. And until a few weeks ago, or a couple of months ago or so, that was the most distant object that we knew of in the universe. <laughs> it was imaged with the UK's Germany North Telescope. It's actually one that's jointly owned and built by the UK and some other people as well. I believe in the cuts that we had a couple of years ago, we are now, in fact, stopping using that at the end of this year, or end of 2012, I think. But it's a very, very nice telescope. That's up on the top of Mauna Kea. And that's a picture of that. So that was, until recently, the most distant object known in the universe. Uh, I have to tell you that I'm afraid it's been beaten because detailed observations of galaxies in what's called the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. This is when the Hubble telescope looks at one spot for days on end, integrating the very weak signals. It did one in the Northern Hemisphere. We got involved with the Jodrell Bank, with Merlin. But the Southern Hemisphere, one we obviously couldn't, 
But that was the Hubble Ultra Deep Field in the south, and although you will not see it there, there was an object in here, which is that little thing which you can barely see, and that has a spectrum which shows it was actually seen as it was 600 million years after the origin of the universe. That's actually a very significant observation because it means, as we're going to come to at the very end of this lecture, that there was just a period of a few hundred million years before the formation of the first stars and galaxies in our universe. Um, just a nice thought. In 2008, again not long ago, the optical afterglow of a GRB 080319B B says it was the second one observed on the 13th of uh, March in 2008, had a visual magnitude for a short while of plus 5.8. In principle, that is visible on a dark, clear, transparent night, no moon, to what I would a few years ago have said was the naked eye, but apparently that's politically incorrect, so I have to use the word unaided eye. <laughs> Um, that's true. Um, schools in America, and I don't blame them, have what they call nanny software that scans everything that people download off the web. And it looks for all naughty words, and obviously naked is one of these. And that meant that schools were not able to download the sites from, for example, Sky and Telescope magazine, you know, which is the, astronomy mag the best astronomy magazine in the world, probably, because, of course, occasionally it talked about naked eye visibility. So I don't want that. So Anyway, so the point is, had anybody seen that, as far as we know, nobody did, but in principle one could have done, the photons that were detected by your retina had left their object 7.5 billion years ago. You would have seen more than halfway back in time to the origin of the universe. I think it's a nice thought. Sadly, as far as we know, nobody actually was able to do it, but it was fun. So look, we know these things are very, very far away. So in principle, we can detect, so we can calculate the amount of energy that they have to produce to make them appear so bright at such a great distance. Um, let's do an analogy. Um, how can we calculate the energy output of the sun? I would say that probably at least half of you could do that if you had a bit of paper and an envelope and perhaps a little calculator on your mobile phone. You could, half of you could do it. But does anybody think they could do it? You'll all say no, won't you? How on earth could I possibly do that? Well, all you need to know to start with is how much energy falls on one square metre, say, of the Earth's surface. And you'll say, well, I don't know that. But look, just think about it. Let's do a thought experiment. Imagine you were at, in the Sahara somewhere, and the sun was directly over your head. You'd feel quite hot, wouldn't you? Okay, now imagine it's, the sun's gone, it's totally dark. But above you, just, in fact, if I stand here and don't fall over, there's a little light or something. First of all, imagine it's a 100 watt bulb. Secondly, imagine it's one of those little one kilowatt, you know those little radiant lamps you have in bathrooms sometimes? And thirdly, imagine if it's a 10 kilowatt arc light. Now think, don't do anything, but think which of those three would be most like sitting there under the sun overhead. 100 watt bulb, one kilowatt sort of radiant heat lamp, 10 kilowatt arc light. I wish you could all have little buttons. You know these things, in, they have little buttons and you press which one, A, B and C. Decide which it is and don't let anything change your mind. Hands up those who think it might be a 100, 100 watt bulb. One, that's obviously in the minority. <laughs> all right. Uh, hands up those, oh two, I'm sorry, do apologise. Hands up those that might think it was about a one kilowatt heat ray lamp. Actually, not all that many, quite a few. And then, is it all the rest think it's a 10 kilowatt arc lamp? I think you'd be a bit frazzled. <laughs> I mean, I was expecting, to be honest, most of you would say it was like a one kilowatt heat lamp. Because if you stand in one of those in the bathroom, you know, it, 
it feels quite warm. But look, you're, you're actually, between the two of you, you're right, because the exact number is 1.37 kilowatts. So it's not as much as 10, it's a bit more than 1. But look, would you agree you could get an estimate at least within a factor of 10 and probably a factor of 2 to 5? Do you see that? Just as a thought experiment. It's what we call a guesstimate. Now, the only other thing you need to know is how far it is from the Earth to the Sun, and that's 93 million miles, but we ought to talk about kilometres, it's 150 million kilometres. If you know what the formula is for the area of the surface of a sphere of that radius, you know, 4 pi r squared, you can calculate how many square metres there are in the shell surrounding the Sun at the distance of the Earth. Do you get the idea? All the radiation from the Sun must go through that shell. So all you need to know is that area times 1.37 and you've got the answer. And in fact, 4 pi r squared is the formula you use. 1.5 times 10 to 11 is 150 million kilometres. In fact, sorry, metres, I should say. That squared times 4 pi and you multiply that by 1.37 and you get 3.86 times 20, 10 to 26 watts. But you get the idea. It's not difficult. That's exactly what one does with a gamma ray burst. The amount of energy that's detected is very small, but on the other hand, the distance is not measured in millions of kilometres, it's billions of light years. So A is absolutely enormous. And basically, if you assume that the power is radiated what's called isotropically, then in fact, it would, the energy involved is what you'd have to have if the sun was suddenly the whole of its mass converted to energy. There's nothing that can do that. So what we believe is that the energy must be beamed. So it's like if you had the, a bulb of a torch just by itself, powered up to a battery, you'd see a little light. If it's actually in a torch, there's a beam. If you look along the beam, if you see the beam, it looks bright. Elsewhere you don't see it at all. It concentrates the energy. So that begins to make sense, and the total energy is about having to convert one two thousandth the solar mass into energy instantaneously pretty well, and that is theoretically possible, so that's good. It turns out, we've seen many thousands of bursts now, there are two types. The majority are long period, that is, they take many seconds, maybe 10, 20 seconds or so, defined as being greater than two seconds in length. The minority, a short period, less than two seconds. There's some nice short, sharp ones there. One or two seconds in total length. We believe they have two different origins, but both result from the evolution of massive stars. The long period ones, we believe, are the result of supernovae or hypernovae. The short period ones, we believe, are the result of neutron stars merging, as we shall see. So we need to know a little bit about the evolution of stars. And I know I talked about this in a, a lecture a year or so ago called Aging Stars, but I hope you'll let me summarise what we learnt. Um, a star forms out of dust and gas, which gradually under gravity gets smaller and smaller and smaller. If the core reaches a temperature of over about 10 million Kelvin, then nuclear fusion starts and it becomes a star and stabilises. This is our time. This is our sun. But eventually that fuel runs out. It then expands, becomes what we call a red giant, before it finally explodes. And our own sun does something like this. It starts off as a cool bit of mass, but it's quite big actually, so it's still quite bright. It comes down, it lives here for a long time. Then in fact it gets much cooler, so it moves over to the, this is cooler and redder over here, but it gets much brighter because it's very big, then it gets all it oscillates a bit, blows off the outer parts, and the rest is just left behind as what's called a white dwarf, as we shall see. Uh, there's a white dwarf in the constellation of Lyra. It's down here. This is Vega, and there's two stars here, and it's just between the two. It looks like this. Um, the colours you see, the red is hydrogen, but that lovely turquoise colour are the lines of oxygen. So in a star, once the hydrogen has turned into helium, you start building up carbon, oxygen, nitrogen and other elements. And when the star explodes, they blow off into its place, leaving behind something we call a white dwarf. That is held up by what is called electron degeneracy pressure. 
It is a result of quantum mechanics. Essentially, if you try and squeeze electrons too close together, they don't like it very much, and they will produce a force that can basically oppose gravity and stop the collapse. Our sun, the core of it, will end up eventually as something about the size of the Earth. That's what happens with sort of smallish stars, those about the size of our sun, and certainly smaller and perhaps a bit bigger. If you have more massive stars, perhaps eight times greater in mass than our sun, they evolve much more quickly. They don't live very long as stars, perhaps 15 million years or so. They burn helium into carbon, and they expand again and become quite enormous. They're very cool, but because they're so big, they are very bright, perhaps a million times brighter than our sun. They're red supergiants. <coughs> and there's a lovely example. You've all, I hope, seen Orion in the southern sky the last few weeks when it's been clear. The upper left-hand star of Orion is called Betelgeuse. The Americans might say Betelgeuse. And here it is, a red supergiant. It's about the size of the orbit of Jupiter. It is really quite enormous. So that's a red supergiant. And just to give, again, an idea of scale, there's our sun, and Betelgeuse, oh, I can't do it, but you get the idea, is pretty big. They can carry on their nuclear fusion process way beyond smaller stars, and they end up with a core made of iron, and perhaps nickel. They are the most stable nuclei. You can't do better than that. These stars then often blow off much of their outer envelopes. They become rather unstable. And there's a star we'll come back to called Eta Carina that actually blew off its outer layers about 100 years or so ago. And it disappeared for a bit because it was hidden by the dust. But now as the dust has expanded, you can actually still see the star right in the centre. We'll come back to that in a little while. So, when these stars come to the end of their lives, the core made of iron can no longer produce any energy to support or to oppose gravity. It collapses down. It tends to rebound once it's got to the bottom. The outer parts of the star are falling in, or at least the inner parts, and you get sort of one lot going in, one bit coming out, and you get an incredible compression of the gas and you get a thermonuclear explosion of epic proportions. And that we call a supernova. And one thing to know about supernovae, in just a few seconds, the neutrons flying around build up all the heavier elements than iron. So any gold you might have with you, basically, was produced in a supernova. And then these parts are blown off into space. There's a nice example in Constellation of Taurus. It's up here. It looks like that. So we do have, not very often, these fairly epic explosions. This is the remnant of a star that was seen to explode in the year 1054. Another famous one is called Tycho's supernovae of 1572. But we haven't had one for an awful long time. We'd love to have one to look at nearby, but not too close. Um, if the mass of the core is above a limit of uh, 1.4 solar masses, then electron degeneracy pressure, the thing that supports white dwarfs, that's had it. Gravity can actually get overcome that. And the thing gets smaller and smaller and smaller until finally it becomes what we call a neutron star, a giant nucleus. And there's something called neutron degeneracy pressure, another quantum mechanical effect which prevents any further contraction. At this time, the thing has a diameter of perhaps 10 to 20 kilometres, or a radius of 10 to 20 kilometres. If something's big, rotating slowly, and you make it get smaller, it spins up. So these neutron stars, you would expect to be spinning quite quickly. Well, I've talked about this before, but very briefly, these neutron stars were a theoretical concept, and they were discovered in the 1960s by a young lady called Jocelyn Bell, who was Tony Hewish's student at Cambridge, and she helped build a, a, a very large radio telescope, actually. It looked a bit like a vineyard, but it was a very big telescope, much bigger than our Jodrell Bank one. And with that, she was looking at about 400 feet of chart every day, observing a particular characteristic of radio sources. And she discovered what she called a little bit of fluff. And uh, it turned out that this 
In fact, when they looked at it in detail, it was not a little bit of fluff. It was, in fact, a sequence of very short, rapid pulses. And uh, no one could understand how you could actually get any natural phenomena giving rise to a very accurately spaced sequence of pulses. She thought it might be E.T. phoning home. And she called it LGM1 for Little Green Men 1. Well, someone called Tommy Gold, an American who was working at Cambridge, realised what these things were. Neutron stars, very small, perhaps 20 kilometres or so across, rapidly rotating with an incredibly powerful magnetic field. This appears to be usually not along the axis of rotation, just like the Earth's field. So as the thing rotates, the field is going around. And this seems to produce beams of light sometimes and radio waves usually, which sweep around the sky. If one of these beams happens to be pointing towards us at one time of its rotation, each time the beam crosses our position in space, we see a pulse of energy like that. So you can see why you get a very accurately spaced set of pulses. Those things are very massive. They are very, very good clocks. I'll move that. Now, um, some years ago, astronomers at Jodrell Bank, which is where I come from, discovered two of these objects co-rotating. It takes about 2.4 hours for one to go around the other. They're so close you could fit the orbits in the inside of our sun. This is just to try and hypnotise you briefly. But that's just an idea of what's going on. Now, Einstein, you've all heard of him, we've talked about him. He says, if you have a pair of objects co-rotating, then they will emit gravitational waves. And that's an idea. Little ripples of space-time that travel out at the speed of light through the universe. But they take energy away from the system. That's got to come from somewhere. And what happens is, these two objects are slowly spiralling in towards each other. The rate we have measured at Jodrell Bank is 7 millimetres per day. It is precisely what Einstein predicts. This is the very end of their life. The green grid is space-time. You can see some ripples going out. The two are just about to coalesce into one. As they do so, you get a gravitational wave tsunami, which may be detected before long. But did you see that little burst there? That's a gamma ray burst. So that's one little way of looking at it. Uh, this is a bit smaller, but it's just a slightly more artistic way of doing it. Here are the two things beginning to coalesce and form one object. Well, we'll see what that gives rise to very shortly. We think that the result of that is a black hole, which is rotating, as you see there, and the jets of gamma rays come off along the rotation axis of the black hole in the centre. So this is one source, we believe, in fact, the source of short period gamma rays. And this, in fact, in 2005, is an image of the very first visible counterpart of a short burst GRB, as it's called. It doesn't have to be the coalescence of two neutron stars. Oh, those are the final moments. You can see the two getting closer together. They finally come together as one. They form a black hole. We talked about those not that long ago. And you get these two opposing beams of gamma rays, initially followed by an afterglow at other wavelengths. And this, we believe, seen in X-rays by the Chandra satellite, is in fact the merger of a black hole with a neutron star. So neutron star, neutron star, black hole neutron star, or even a neutron star gradually picks up material by its gravity from the surroundings and finally exceeds the mass that can be supported by neutron degeneracy pressure and that will also collapse into a black hole. So three basic mechanisms of producing black holes which we believe give rise to the short period gamma ray bursts. So such mergers of neutron stars and the like are thought to be the source of the short period GRBs. What about 
the long period ones? Well, we think they come from the final stages of a life of a supernova or a hypernovae. Um, a hypernovae is said to come from a star that is actually 200 solar masses, so very, very massive stars. But the two are pretty much the same. The word hypernovae didn't actually come around until quite recently. So the core of a giant star is too massive to be held up by neutron degeneracy pressure and collapses down directly to form a black hole. And here is one in the galaxy M74 that's not too far away from us. I always like the way you get these big arrows on the sky to help you find things. Um, and this is sort of the idea. This is a star evolving. It finishes up with a core of iron, as I said, surrounded by shells, a bit like an onion. Magnesium, neon, silicon, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, helium, hydrogen. And the centre part falls down, becomes a black hole. And then a rather nice thing happens. I'm going to show you a movie, which I think is really rather good. That's just a, a, the, the start of it. The black hole is formed in the centre and the two beams of gamma rays are just being emitted from it in opposite, in opposing directions. What it does, it sort of bores a bigger and bigger hole and gradually just destroys the star. Isn't that lovely? And right in the centre, we're going to zoom in now, is the black hole can't actually see the black hole, of course, surrounded by what's called an accretion disk. And it's the material that falls in towards the black hole from the accretion disk that actually does it. Shall I just do that once more? I think we can... It is rather nice, if I can actually get there. There we go, just to see that. So this is what we believe is the source of the long period gamma rays. And as I said, the energy that's given off in quite a short period of time is equivalent to about one two hundredth the total mass content of our sun. These are pretty impressive things. And someone went out there with a camera and took a very nice picture of one in a star cluster. That's a rather nice piece of uh, graphic art, I think. So in summary, gamma ray bursts, two types. The long gamma ray bursts, the results that I've just shown you, of a massive star whose core is so big, when it collapses down, nothing will stop it becoming a black hole. The second ones, the short period bursts, are when you have two neutron stars, say, or a black hole, a neutron star, or whatever, they spiral in towards each other. That's all down to Einstein. He's got an awful lot to blame, to blame for. Until they finally coalesce and also form a black hole. The energy involved there isn't quite as great, but still quite a lot. Should we be afraid? No, not really. Um, first of all, we believe that those very massive stars that form the black holes were more likely to form in the early days of the universe. We don't see any nearby, which is not too surprising because they're very rare. We suspect you'd only have one of these the order of every million years in our Milky Way galaxy. And you've seen they're beamed. And the likelihood of the beam being pointed at us is again quite low. So I, I really think we shouldn't be too worried. Uh, this is one of the, the two stars that we think are going to do this in the quotes near future, but I can't tell you what near is. It could be tomorrow. It could already have happened and the beam's coming towards us at the speed of light but it could well be millions of years in the future. That's one of them, and I mentioned Eta Carina. This is in the southern hemisphere, but there's an encouraging thing here. Can you see the axis of the rotation of the star? It's that way. That's not pointing at us. That's important, because if that was pointing towards us, then at some point in the future, it might be a problem in the southern hemisphere. What could happen if a gamma ray burst reached the Earth it could destroy the ozone layer, it would let much more ultraviolet light reach the ground, it could really cause a major problem. And some people suspect that one of the mass extinctions about 440 million years ago could have been caused by a nearby gamma ray burst. We think the number of stars that's going to do this is very low, but there's nothing to stop two neutron stars coming together. They'll be happening at fairly regular intervals, but again, very rarely. So I think we can go home and sleep easy tonight. 
So, just for the final 15 minutes, let me say something about the Big Bang origin of the universe, which you could say was the biggest bang that has ever happened. Um, just to set the scene, um, my final lecture, by the way, called To Infinity and Beyond, I will try and summarise, take you through the last almost 100 years of cosmology, how it's developed as a subject and what we suspect it may be happening to it in the future. So this is just a little bit where I can spend a bit more time about the Big Bang than I'd be able to in a single lecture. Hubble showed the universe was expanding. A bit more about that in the next lecture, which is called Hubble's Heritage. A.A. A. Friedman, a Russian, derived an infinite set of models using Einstein's general theory of relativity to model an expanding universe, as we shall shortly see. In all these models, the whole universe expands from what is called a singularity, zero size, infinite mass and density. If you came to my lecture on black holes, you know I don't like singularities. Essentially, it's where the physics, in this case, general relativity, breaks down. Fred Hoyle called these the big, this the Big Bang model, or these the Big Bang models of the universe, and the point and the origin is thus called the Big Bang. I'm sure you all know that. There are three things I'd like to say, because I often get asked questions to these three points. Uh, where was it? And the answer is it was everywhere. The whole of the universe was once essentially, I'm not going to say at one point, as you'll see later on, but within a very, very small volume of space, perhaps a metre across. So we were all together, or at least whatever caused this eventually, we were all very close together in the same point. Everywhere in the universe now was once at the Big Bang. Secondly, where is it expanding into? The answer, it isn't. It did not expand into space. It is not expanding into space. Now, the Big Bang created the space into which it's expanding. So space was created by the Big Bang. It wasn't there before. Um, in the currently accepted theories, it was also the origin of time. As Augustine has said, the universe was created with time, not in time. I don't actually think that was a quote, because I tried to find it, but it's just a, a, an encapsulation of a somewhat longer thing that he said, but essentially that's the essence of what he said. And he was, in that sense, right. The universe was created with time, not in time. Time did not exist before the Big Bang. Okay, that was the, those were the standard Big Bang models. But it didn't take an awful long time, well, that's what it did, from about 1930 up to about 1970, for people to realise that there were some real problems with this sort of standard Big Bang model. One of them, which is my own worry, it's not one that you generally read about, I don't like the thought that all, all the mass and energy of the universe was once in a singularity of infinite density. Uh, I say, as others do, it just means the theory of relativity has broken down. Um, and you'll see what I think happened or what we think happened shortly. There's a second problem. Friedman produced essentially an infinite number of models of the Big Bang universe. They all start from the Big Bang at the origin. It's a little bit like me throwing a ball up in the air. If there's not enough energy of expansion, in my case throwing up a ball fast enough, gravity wins and the universe is collapsed down again. So there's an infinite variety of what are called closed universes, where the universe expands to a maximum size and then collapses down to what's called the big crunch. We don't think this will happen, but if it did, it would be at least 120 billion years. So, again, don't worry about it. Now, if I kept on throwing up a ball at faster and faster speeds, there would come a point where it would just leave the Earth. It would carry on slowing down with time until eventually it came to a halt, infinite time in the future at infinite distance. That's just having got what we call the escape velocity. Here, there's what we call the critical universe, where that's exactly what happens. The universe continues to expand at an ever-reducing rate until it comes to a halt at an infinite time in the future. And that's just one case. It's the case between what are called the closed universes, which will eventually come back, 
and the open ones that just go away and expand a bit faster. And what we now know is that we are very, very close to this. And there's nothing in the laws of physics that says why that should be so. That's a slight worry. The other thing is called the horizon problem. If there was a Big Bang, the universe was once very, very hot. As the universe has expanded, although the temperature would drop, it wouldn't drop to absolute zero. And way back, George Gamow and his students predicted the universe, if you put a thermometer in the middle of nowhere, would measure about 10 Kelvin, 10 degrees above absolute zero. Richard Dickey predicted it was about 5 Kelvin. The radiation related to that temperature was discovered by Penzias and Wilson, who got the Nobel Prize, and it's actually at 2.73 degrees. Um, what they found, though, was the temperature in every direction they looked was identical, and that's called the horizon problem. Um, how can that be? Look, there's a problem. The radiation that reaches me from over there has only travelled for 30, well, has travelled for 13.6 billion years, the age of the universe. The radiation that reaches me from over there has travelled the same time. But there's no way that any radiation from over there could have got to over there, because the universe isn't old enough. So how do they know the same temperature? Here's an analogy. I'm on a ship, and it's a British ship. You see it's got a red ensign. Okay. <laughs> now, over the horizon, I see the mass of... Obviously, I don't actually see the whole of it, but I see this ship, and I see it's got a flag. Well, I don't see that to start with, but as I'm an astronomer, I climb up to the crow's nest, and uh, I have a telescope. Do you see the telescope? Here they are. And then I can see the flag on that ship. While I'm up there, I look in the opposite direction, and I see another ship, and it's got exactly the same flag, and I can only just about see that above the horizon. Can you see that the people on those two ships cannot see each other? They're below each other's horizon. So how have they got the same flag? The obvious thing is they've come from the same place, some port somewhere, and they belong to the same shipping line or the same army, uh, the same navy, whatever. So at one point in the past, they were causally connected, that's the word we use, that they were in a sufficient volume of space that information could travel between them at no more than the speed of light. So what we say is that the universe had at one point to be so small that the whole of it was in thermal equilibrium. And that can't be the case in the standard Big Bang theory. It was Alan Guff who came up with an idea, and I call it an idea, not a theory to start with. The idea is called inflation. That prior to inflation, there was a little bit of space tiny, probably almost empty. But then, over a very short period of time, and the times I've given in the transcript, but I'm not going to go through them now in detail, it expanded by some enormous factor, 10 to the 50, 10 to the 60, in size. And that's a lot of expansion in a short time, and we call that inflation. We suspect that at the end of the inflationary period, the universe was somewhere between the size of a golf ball and a metre ball. Something like that. But of, of order skies of a metre. And then it continued to expand in the way of the standard model. Now, there are two things that result from this. First of all, if you blow a balloon up by 10 to the power 60 times, can you see what was once possibly a curved surface becomes flat? It's got so enormous. So it drives, inflation would make us live in this basically critical universe where we say space is flat. More of that in the last lecture. So that's a good thing. Also, prior to inflation, everywhere in the universe was causally connected so it could all be at the same temperature. So in the revised model, the initial infinitesimally small volume of space from which our universe sprang may have started from effectively nothing. A little quantum fluctuation that had the right properties to allow this period of inflation. Now, this is the key thing which solves my other problem. At the end of the inflationary period, when the thing was reasonably big, there was what they call a phase transition 
associated with what's called a strong nuclear force. Don't worry about that. But essentially, that phase transition created a vast amount of energy. Energy equals matter. That's where everything came from. So it wasn't all in a tiny point. It was all perhaps once in something about the size of a metre, which I can cope with a bit better. Whether you can or not is another matter, but anyway. Now, how can all this lot, how can everything in our universe come from nothing? And the answer is that the universe in total is nothing. The total energy content of our universe is actually zero. Now, the point is, all the matter that exists in the universe has, what's, has got what's called gravitational potential energy. And you can regard that as being negative. Look, if you have a car at the top of a hill and you push it off, it rolls down the hill, it gathers speed, so it gathers kinetic energy, and actually a little bit of mass too, according to Einstein, at the same time, it loses gravitational potential energy. So the two are sort of equal, can be opposite. And it turns out that in the flat universe, there's an exactly equal amount of negative gravitational potential energy as there is in everything else. So the sum of the two is zero. So we're a big sort of excursion from nothing. Um, at the end of this time, there was what's called a quark-gluon soup, a mix of quark and gluons, but it was too hot for protons and neutrons to form, the things we know about. Uh, and I just want to quickly say that rather nicely, I told you this uh, before Christmas, that uh, in November, I think it was, Alice, which is one of the detectors in the Large Hadron Collider, basically crashed together beams of lead nuclei and produced a quark-gluon soup. I'm sure you can all understand that, but those are the tracks of the various particles, the quarks, different types of quarks, and the gluons that were produced in this explosion. And that's the first time, in effect, we've created the conditions that happened a billionth of a second after the origin of the universe. That's rather good. There was a slight excess of matter over antimatter. We believe that virtually identical amounts of matter and antimatter were created. That's what should happen. But it looks as though, because of something called charge parity violation, which you can believe or not, but it may well have happened, that there was about one extra matter particle for every billion antimatter particles. So a billion antimatter, a billion and one matter particles. Obviously, what does matter and antimatter do? You all know about that if you've listened to, read one of um, those books. Um, they annihilate, and you get... Protons and antiprotons annihilating, electrons and positrons annihilating. All the antiparticles disappear, just leaving, A, an awful lot of high-energy photons, and B, relatively small numbers of particles, the one in a billion that were left. So only matter particles were left. We live in a matter universe. Now, finally it got cold enough for the quarks to form neutrons and protons. It turns out that neutrons are unstable. If you had a million of them, in 10 minutes, you'd only be left with 500,000. Half of them would go. It's called the half-life. And they turn into protons, electrons, and anti-neutrinos. So the neutrons began to disappear. And the only ones that were left were those that were locked up in the nuclei of helium, helium-3, deuterium, and lithium. So we have far more protons in our universe now than we have <coughs> neutrons. And that was because the neutrons decay. The relative amounts, in fact, of those four elements tell us quite a lot about the early stages of the universe. By this time, there should have been a lot, lot more antimatter particles. But because we don't know what they are, we don't know how they were formed. That's still a very big question mark over the whole of the Big Bang idea. How did we get all of the dark matter particles? But they were there. So now, finally, we're nearly there, the building blocks of our universe existed. But the atoms still could not form. The photons were very energetic. And sure, the little electron attach itself to a proton to form a hydrogen atom. Very quickly, a photon comes along, kicks it off into space. So essentially, the universe was filled with photons, electrons, and also alpha particles as well. 
The electrons scatter light, just the same way that water droplets scatter light in a fog. Uh, and there's a nice picture showing a fog bank over here. And a bit of an analogy. Would you agree the fog bank is some distance away from us? So the light that reaches us from here has taken a longer time to reach us than the light or anything between us where we can see. So we're sort of looking back into time a bit to a point where we can look no further. And this is exactly the case in our universe. As we look further and further back into time, we come to the point when there were the three electrons. Then the universe was opaque and it looks a bit like a fog bank. 380,000 years after the origin, nearly finished, um, as the universe kept expanding, the photon energy dropped and then the protons and electrons could form hydrogen, the alpha particles and electrons could form helium and so on. So we had the building blocks, the atoms of matter. At that time, the temperature was about 3,000 Kelvin. So the universe was filled with a sort of a yellow-orange light. That's what you get at about 3,000 Kelvin. Since then, the universe has expanded by about a thousand times and the temperature has fallen by the same ratio to about 3 Kelvin. It's actually 2.73 Kelvin. That is now, that radiation is in the infrared and the, and the radio. So you have to be a radio astronomer really to see it. And this is a map I was showing you a year or so ago of the fluctuations of that. This is looking back at that fog bank and you see it's not totally smooth it's got structure. And that structure is basically caused by the dark matter that's around. Perhaps six times more of that than normal matter. And they form concentrations, little gravitational wells, into which the hydrogen and the helium could fall and gradually get concentrated and so form a few hundred million years later, as we saw, the very first stars and galaxy. Those fluctuations we see are actually quite a good thing to tell us that inflation probably happened. But it's not 100% right. It's pretty good. We've learnt about dark matter. I've just said that. So, essentially, the hydrogen and the helium was able to form the first stars and galaxies. Some of them were very big, became these hypernovae. And that's that Hubble image of the early days of the universe. Some of those galaxies there as one we saw just earlier, are some of the earliest objects to form in our universe. And so, eventually, about 500 million years or so after the Big Bang, our universe has sprung into life. Thank you very much.